All right, he was a hero to many local boys growing up in the 70s and 80s. Everyone wanted to be Sean Thompson. World champion surfer Sean Thompson has been riding the waves for decades. He's considered one of the greatest surfers of all time. Mm -hmm. I think he's the best. And one of the most influential of the century. Yeah, after the tragic loss of his teenage son, Sean set out to help young people realize their potential and inspire hope through a new book. It's called The Code, The Power of I Will. Welcome back to the this is, this is a beautiful book. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's well, got everything. You. He was one of the world's best surfers, taking on the ocean's most dangerous waves and winning. But his life irrevocably changed with the tragic death of his teenage son. It's like you're flying through space and then whoosh, you come out with this explosion of, of spray and it's just the most amazing moment in your life and you just feel, wow, there can be nothing better than this and then you, whew, you lie on your board and you pedal back out for more. It's incredible. <laughs> the shark hit him and nearly bit his arm off and it destroyed his swimming career, but never destroyed his love for the ocean. And he, uh, my earliest memories of him taking me down to the beach. And uh, for me as a, as, a, as a father now, thinking about taking my new mm -hmm. son, Luke, down to the beach mm -hmm. in a place where you've been nearly killed by a shark. It, he, he was a wonderful guy. Mm -hmm. He wonderful didn't transfer the, his, his fear to you. Never, ever. You he never just, would have had the career you had, and you've been in the water most of your life. And, and, and Sean, tell me what you were telling me yesterday about the fact that you live not what if, but what is. Explain mm -hmm. that to us. Yeah, I think when uh, one has experienced tragedy, it's very easy to go down the path of doubt and regret and the path of, well, I should have, would have, could have. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's so important to, to live, in the, live in the what is mentality as opposed to the what if. Mm -hmm. Because once you start going into the, well, what if, what if, what, what if, yeah. you, you know, you will really lose your mind. And, and I think that, I think I managed to grasp that at a, at a really early stage in the grief. And it just helped me through it all. And I will never fight a riptide. A lot of people spend their life, don't they, swimming, just fighting, just fighting upstream. and fighting and yeah. fighting, right? Exactly. I think there's inexorable trends that are running through society. And, and, yeah. and one has to flow with them rather than fight against them. And, and, and I think it's just a lesson there. You've got to pick your battles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, the barrel shots, there's some slow motion shots of him riding the foam ball. Um, just unbelievable modern way ahead of its time barrel riding I was 19 years old in the middle of a economics degree at Natal University I travel over to Hawaii to uh, compete and I managed to make it through to the finals and uh, the surf got so big that they had to move the contest venue from a place called Sunset Beach to Waimea Bay which was the biggest wave in the world I was the youngest guy in the event I didn't have a board big enough for this 25 foot surf and I remember scrambling around the beach, finding the nine-foot-long surfboard. That's what we used when the surf got really big, borrowing a board. And paddling out, really determined to do well, because it was my first chance at success in, uh, in Hawaii. And uh, there were six of us in the final, and I remember paddling out on this enormous day. And the five finalists, who were all experienced Waimea surfers, sat in a group, and I paddled right around the group onto the inside, closest to the impact zone. And the first wave of the final came up about 25 feet, which doesn't sound that big. But when you have a three-story building falling down on your head, it's a big, big wave. This wave came, and I remember starting paddling for it, and I was so confident, I, I, I was so focused. And this wave reared up on the reef, and I paddled over the edge, and I thought, man, this is a piece of cake. I can still remember thinking that, having that sort of arrogance in my mind, man, this is a piece of cake. And I remember taking off and going about... A, a third of the way down, the wave, the wave suddenly hit the reef, jacked up till it was completely vertical, and I just dropped through space. I landed, and I managed to land on my board, my legs buckled, and then I skipped across the ocean like a stone, like you skip a stone across the surface of the water, and I bounced, and I bounced, and I bounced. And that's the worst thing that can happen to a surfer in big waves, is when you don't penetrate the surface. Because when you penetrate, you have a little bit of a cushion between you and this enormous lip of water, there's tons of water that are sort of rearing over your head like a serpent. And the wave blasted me, landed right on my back, and just, it felt like being in an intersection and four cement mixes smashing into you. I mean, the, the, the violence of the impact was almost indescribable. And it took me down deep. It was dark and black down there, and there was just these terrible sounds of rocks thrashing around on the coral reef. I was absolutely terrified. I didn't know what sort of injury I'd sustained either because the impact was, was so severe. I managed to sort of doggy paddle my way to the surface. And as I got to the surface, 
you have all this turbulence and white water on the surface, so it's very difficult to break through and just get a gulp of water. As I got my first gulp of water, the second wave mowed me down. I got a one half gulp, the second wave mowed me down, and the third wave, and eventually I got swept into the channel, and my board had gone in, and I came up and I couldn't move my legs. I thought I'd broken my back. I was terrified. There was no lifeguards in those days. You were really on your own out there in a contest. And I remember doggy paddling 300 yards into to my surfboard and uh, at 19 years old coming to that fundamental decision. Now, what should I do? The shore was 50 yards away. It was 350 yards back out to the break. Uh, what do I do? And it was that, that, that moment of decision for a young guy. And... Um, the shore looked very inviting. It didn't look too inviting to paddle back out. But I remember swinging my board around and paddling back out. And that moment, that momentary decision, I think changed my life. I don't think I would have become successful as a surfer. I don't think... Um, I think my life would, would have been a lot different if I, if I hadn't paddled back out. In 1997, my wife Carla and I started a, a wonderful brand called Solitude in the United States. And we, we started to become really successful. We started to sell our product in the best stores, Nordstrom, Saks, Barney's, Bloomingdale's. Things were going so well for us. Then we got involved with a bad partner. Business started slowing down. 9-11 happened. And we were faced with, with all these orders and we didn't have the financial wherewithal to execute them, plus a slowdown in the market at the same time. So we struggled our way on for a number of months, and ultimately, uh, Carla said to me, Sean, we, we can't continue. We'd run out of personal resources. We couldn't get anyone to fund the business, and uh, we came to that decision, well, we're going to have to shut down. And it was a very tough decision. Obviously, there was pride associated with it. You know, we'd... I'd, I'd had, a, had a successful career, and we built this amazing brand that we both loved, and we put so much into it, and we had these amazing customers, but you know, we were faced with that decision, we were going to have to shut it down. So the Friday afternoon, we decided to, to bring our, our friends in and bring a whole crew in and start dismantling the office, moving all the stuff out the warehouse. And uh, all of our friends rallied, and just tons of stuff was moving out. We were going to put it in storage. And then... Um, the guys came to the company, works, the company server and my workstation. And I said, no, you can't take the stuff. I just, we've got to fight another day. On the Saturday morning, I get a phone call from a, my best mate. He said, listen, Sean, I was at baseball practice today. He ba was a baseball coach. And he said, I was wearing a solitude shirt. And a guy came up to me and said, wow, I really like that shirt you're wearing. It's a great looking shirt. He said, yeah, it's Sean and Carla's company, Solitude. He said, but they're closing the business today. He said, well, my father and I love the brand. We've heard of the brand. We're investors in, 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 in businesses. We'd love to chat to Sean and Carla. We met them on the Sunday. We did, a, we did a handshake deal on the Sunday. On Monday, we opened up for business again. Three years later, I was on Park Avenue in New York City, on the 35th floor of a publicly traded corporation with the fourth biggest retailer in the United States sitting across from me and a publicly traded company who was interested in buying us on the basis that I would get an order from this fourth biggest retailer in the world. So I said to her, I showed her the line, the same line that we had nearly closed three years before, and I said to her, so what's it going to be? You like the line? She said, yes, I like the line. I said, well, what's, what's it going to be? She said, we're going to open a $30 million, $30 million order. I put my hand across the table, shook her hand. We went on, we sold the company the following week. And if I hadn't paddled back out there that day at Waimea Bay, I don't think that would have ever happened to me. Take the drop with commitment. Commitment. A very, very powerful word. This is the Banzai Pipeline in Hawaii, the single most dangerous wave in the world. It's killed about 23 people. Every year, one, two guys die at the Banzai Pipeline. And for me, this wave was always the ultimate challenge. 
As a young boy growing up in Durban, the Banzai pipeline was this revered and feared wave. It was a wave that I always wanted to succeed at, but I was terrified of this place. The first time I surfed out there, I sat out in the water for half an hour and didn't catch a wave. It was absolutely terrifying. It took me about three or four years when I started to feel a reasonable amount of confidence out there. And then I had this revelation one day out there. It was a very, very big day. This enormous wave came towards me. I was very frightened. And I remember swinging around and starting to paddle for this wave. And I was in that moment of hesitation that we all have when we're faced with an obstacle or a challenge. And I put my head down and I took three more strokes with absolute commitment. And that single wave changed my life. Because once I made the commitment, once I took the extra strokes, once in my mind I knew I was going to go over that edge, all the fear went away. It was incredible that commitment takes the fear away. We all have different fears, all of us. Fear of success, fear of failure. But when you take that step and take the drop with commitment, it's amazing how that fear goes away, that fear dissipates. And as a young boy, this was a wonderful moment for me to know that you make the commitment, you take the step, and the fear goes away. I want to talk to you about a special moment that happened between my beautiful boy Matthew and I. The beach where, where I now surf in, in Santa Barbara is called Hammond's Reef. It's only about a two-minute drive away from my home. It's a beautiful secluded beach. It has a wonderful meadow in front of it, surrounded by multi-million dollar homes. It's a sacred space to the Shumash Indian, which is a local Native American uh, tribe. And there's a beautiful memorial to the Shumash people. The Shumash people still uh, engage in some of their sacred rituals on, on the beach there. And there's a beautiful memorial on this meadow. It's got an inscription, the sacredness of the land lies in the mind of its people. This land is dedicated to the spirit and memory of the ancestors and their children. It's a beautiful inscription just talking about our connection to the land, about the past, the future, and the present. And uh, I loved that inscription. Matthew loved it as well. And we used to go up there when we used to go down to the beach and check out the surf because Matthew and I used to go and surf at Hammonds. <clears throat> and on this particular day, we went down the beach. There was no surf. It was a gray day, stormy. Um, and he said, Dada, let's go up to the memorial. He used to call me Dada when his pals weren't around. So we went up there to the memorial and we put down some, some little like offerings, you know, bits of uh, shell and stuff. That was sort of the, 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 the Shumash tradition. And uh, <clears throat> he said, Dada, come down with me to the beach. I want to do something. So we scampered off down the beach to that beautiful beach. And he started to pick up the cobblestones that lay on the beach, and he made an enormous circle of cobblestones on the beach. And inside that circle, he made another circle of cobblestones, and I helped him along the way. And inside that, he made a third circle. So we had three concentric circles of cobblestones, and he made a path through into the centermost uh, ring, and he put down two large stones, which, which were to serve as our seats. And then he ran off down the beach, and he got a stick, piece of driftwood, and in that he put a feather and a bit of kelp. And I just went along with the game. I didn't know what it was about. And he said, Daddy, you sit here. And I sat there. And he said, this is a sacred story stick. <clears throat> he said, this is a sacred story circle, and we're going to tell each other sacred stories. So the two of us sat inside the sacred story circle for about an hour, and we just told each other stories. And that moment um, between us was just electric. That moment when there's no cell phone, there's no internet, there's nothing. It's just you and your child connecting inside a sacred story circle was just memorable. And out of all the great moments that I've spent on the beach and all the great contest wins that I've had and all the magnificent waves that I've ridden, all the beautiful places I've seen, that little circle is the most beautiful place that I've ever been on the beach. And it was so special. And that concept of just passing the stoke back and forth through stories or through whatever you do with your children <coughs> or with a loved one, it's a special, special time. Never fight a riptide. This is the beach that I grew up in Durban, South Africa. Uh, a place called the Bay of Plenty. And you can see on the right-hand side of the picture, there's an area the waves <clears throat> aren't breaking. This is called the Riptide. It's a very dangerous place. If you're a swimmer, you get caught in the Riptide, you get sucked out to sea, 
and you can drown. The riptide, as a metaphor for life, represents these inexorable trends that are running through society. 